CBS Media Demo. Hello and welcome to ibbusinessandmanagement.com. I'm Mr. Burton and today we are running through 5.4 quality assurance. Now remember that this is within the operations management unit of the course. I'm Mr. Burton, site author of ibbusinessandmanagement.com. Um, you're with me today listening to Quality Assurance as part of the IB Diploma Business and Management course. Sit back, take it in, take some notes, hope you learned something today. 5.4, let's get going. We have two important distinctions to be able to make and basically we make these distinctions through definitions. Uh, quality control and more um, recently within operations management quality assurance and quality assurance has been made famous by the Japanese when they were achieving outstanding levels of quality in the production of consumer goods uh, definition the methods used by a business to reassure its customers about the quality of their products in meeting certain quality standards now there's definitely been um, a huge paradigm shift moving from quality control to quality assurance so from one thought system to another essentially as we shifted from quality control to quality assurance there was a rejection of mass inspections by one individual department often these large companies used to have um, a, a specialized department called quality control and it was their job to go through and inspect the final product um, make sure it was up to scratch point out flaws and um, not let the reject models get to market So essentially quality control was based on inspection of the product or a sample of the products whereas what we're talking about now quality assurance this was a system of agreeing and meeting quality standards at each stage of the production to ensure consumer satisfaction. Our quality is to be built into each stage of the production process and that quality is analyzed carefully through statistical methods. Staff went underwent what the staff do undergo continuous training. Uh, quality assurance is so important that all staff are involved in this process. Um, the training is continuous, it's widespread, and each and every worker as they go about their job can undertake quality inspection the job for quality control which which we now are talking about as being quality assurance is built in to every single worker's job every single worker becomes responsible for the quality of the final good or service quality becomes everybody's responsibility if the lowly production worker spots a flaw sees something going wrong knows that the final product will not meet um, high standards of quality assurance then there's no problem at all with that worker going up further up the hierarchical barriers between departments and letting, letting um, those higher up in the hierarchy know that something is, is wrong. Quality is becoming everybody's responsibility. To implement a quality assurance program, a PDCA cycle um, of continuous improvement is introduced. So to plan the production process to ensure 
that quality is um, exactly what consumers expect. There's planning where the right data is looked at, problems are analyzed and the solutions are planned. Implement that plan, check that that has been implemented correctly and then action it to modify any processes as necessary. Now, uh, two, two names here, Demings from the PDCA cycle and Ishikawa of Fishbone fame. Um, these, these guys, and, and they, they were guys, began the total quality management movement the shift away from quality control. Stages in quality assurance. The product is designed and the product is designed so to meet the product expectations of consumers. Oh, actually, I guess before we get any further, there's an exam tip here which is, is quite important. Now, quality is often viewed by candidates as an absolute concept and not a relative one. Now, the product does not necessarily need to be a superlative. It doesn't, doesn't have to be the best no-flaws thing out there. When you're talking about quality, you should be explaining it with reference to the expectations of the target market consumers. If I don't want to pay full price for a product, um, a computer, if I'd prefer to pay $700 for a new laptop than $2,500, then I'm probably likely to accept lesser quality. So the level of quality selected by any business must be based on the resources available to it, the needs of the target market and the quality standards of competitors. Right, product design. Quality of inputs. Quality must not be let down by bought-in components. Suppliers will have to accept and keep to strict quality standards. Production quality, and this can be assured by total quality management and emphasizing with workers that quality levels must not drop below preset standards. The delivery systems, customers need goods and services delivered at times convenient to them. The punctuality and reliability of delivery systems must be monitored. An appropriate customer service, including after-sales service, needs to be implemented, set in place. A continued customer satisfaction is going to depend on the quality of contact with consumers after purchase. Um, for example, Nissan car factories have predetermined quality standards set and checked at each stage of the assembly of vehicles. And these, this, this, these checks are done by the workers accountable for them. First Direct, a European telephone banking organization, sets limits on waiting times for calls to be answered. How good would that be? How good would that be? Um, average times to be taken for meeting each customer's request and assurance standards to monitor and customer requests have been acted on correctly. Now, quality assurance has the following advantages. It makes everyone responsible for quality, and this can be a form of job enrichment. Self-checking and making efforts to improve quality increases motivation. The system can be used to trace back quality problems to the stage of the production process where a problem might have been occurring. If it's just the end product being checked, we don't know what stage of the production process the flaw is creeping in. And finally, it reduces the need for expensive final inspection and correction or reworking of faulty products. Kaizen is the cycle of continuous improvement. Good change in Japanese. 
Right, continuous improvement. Um, yep, yeah, Kaizen, a Japanese term meaning continuous improvement. Now, the philosophy behind this idea is that all workers have something to contribute to improving the way their business operates and the way the product is made. That's all workers. Now, it forms the basis of total quality management. And remember, that's an approach to quality that aims to involve all employees in the quality improvement process. Um, and Kaizen... Lean production is central here as well, and that's producing goods and services with the minimum of wasted resources, while at the same time maintaining high quality. Uh, quality circles are important to this continuous improvement cycle. Uh, small groups of people are uh, being brought together to look at the problems, look at the issues, um, look at the factors involved in the production process and they're thinking about all this with regards to the quality of the final output. Oh, sorry, not the final output, yes, but also the quality that arises from each stage of the production process. And these quality circles are then going to make recommend recommendations for the improvement of, the, of production to, to senior management. The organizational goal here is to introduce small incremental changes to operations and therefore improve quality. Subordinates, quality circles should be introduced for subordinates and management to work together to identify causes of poor quality. So again those hierarchical barriers are broken down subordinates and management are working together subordinates will have a very 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 good idea if they've got the appropriate training to be able to identify think about the causes of poor quality and how to make it better that's right hierarchical bar barriers should be removed and blame should not be a portion. If a worker spots a flaw in their um, way of doing things, the way that things are being produced in his or her line, when they go to see senior management, there should be no blame, they should be congratulated and, and praised. Thank you for pointing out this, this flaw. Um, you, there's no way we can blame you for it. Workers are going to be encouraged to take ownership of their own work, which is empowering, and this empowerment will lead to increased motivation and productivity. And if you can re relate that back to cell production, you, um, this is exactly what it's all about. In Kaizen, the overall goal, the overall intention, is to achieve zero defects or have no failures. And no failure rate. Okay, continuous improvement, statistical control, and data collection need to be rigorous for Kaizen to be um, effective. So, obviously, introducing a Kaizen system into the production takes time it takes scarce resources and that is especially true if the goal is zero defects change is necessary to be able to implement a kaizen into the production production process managers and employees must be willing to change establishing that new equilibrium takes time and perhaps that can be undertaken with the force field analysis. And this is especially true for the introduction of quality circles. New relationship structures can be very difficult um, to form, especially if the corporate culture is built along hierarchical lines. 
constant training is required and ongoing costs of disruption will need to be considered. To take time off for training is going to disrupt the production process. And that's true whether the training is either on the job or off the job. So here what it looks like, traditional um, traditional quality control improvements came in in single steps. Right? Something would be introduced in the production process, perhaps uh, a better machine, and that better machine would improve the quality of the final good. So traditional one-off improvements led to the increased productivity of labour uh, over time. And Kaizen is all about continuous improvement, those small incremental gains by workers increasing their productivity. Uh, Kaizen, continuous improvement, which is a really good um, little diagram to throw down in your IB business and management exams. Benchmarking, this is looking at the best practice within an industry, those competitors or firms out there, the products out there which have excellent performance, using those as a kind of target to emulate. So comparing the performance including the quality of a business with performance standards throughout the industry. Now companies will try to benchmark or measure their operations customer service, marketing, human resource management practices against what is considered to be the market leader in an industry. Copying the best out there. And tr by emulating those, they're going to try to model their own behaviour on what could be considered industry best practice. Raising the bar, raising the standards, producing better and better quality. And some some organizations, some firms out there are, are very, very well known for their high, high standards. For example, um, Singapore Airlines for their customer service within flights is uh, renowned, renowned. And they would be the benchmark for that type of service, which competitors would then try to emulate. Um, definite stages in benchmarking here. The first one is to identify the aspects of the business to be benchmarked and that could be done perhaps by interviewing customers and finding out what they consider to be most important. For example, research may reveal that the most important factors are reliability of the product, speed of delivery and after sales service and then these are the areas that the firm would first benchmark. Stage two, measure the performance in these areas. For example, real reliability records, delivery records, and a number of customer complaints. Thirdly, identify the firms in the industry that are considered to be the best. This process might be assessed by management consultants or by benchmarking schemes operated by government or industry organizations. Four, here is where data comes into play, they're going to use comparative data from the best firms to establish the main weaknesses in the business. Now these data, these data may be obtained from firms by mutual agreement, from published accounts, specialist industry publications and contact with customers and or suppliers. Five, we're going to set standards for improvement and these might be the standards set by the best firms or they could be set even higher to create a competitive advantage. Why set your targets at being the, at, at the best when you could be even better? Number six, change processes to achieve the standard set. Now this is, may require nothing more than a different way of performing one task but more substantial changes may be necessary. And then we're going to re-measure the whole thing. Re-measurement, the change to the process need to be checked to see if new, higher standards are being reached. And benchmarking is not a one-off exercise and to be effective it should be a continuous process to achieve long-term impro improvements in productivity and quality.
Right, we definitely have benefits of benchmarking, which you need to be able to know. And the first benefit that we're going to look at here is that it offers a faster and cheaper way of solving problems than firms attempting to solve production or quality problems without external comparisons. Uh, those areas of greatest significance for customers are identified and the first action is targeted at improving these which is going to immediately increase at customer satisfaction and become a source of competitive advantage. It is a process that it can assist the firm to increase international competitiveness. If we've got a little domestic industry um, striving to compete in the international market, international competitors could be looked at and see what they're doing, find the best practices out there, benchmark those, lift up our own competitiveness. And comparisons between firms in different industries, customer service departments, human resource departments, for example, in a retailer compared to a bank can encourage a useful crossover of ideas. And if we get the workers involved in the comparison exercise, then their participation can lead to better ideas for improvement and increased motivation of these staff. And we all know that more motivated workers are going to be more productive workers, are going to stay with the firm longer, be less absent, and everybody is a winner. Limitations. The big one is, in this benchmarking process, the biggest limitation is obtaining relevant and up-to-date information from other firms in the industry, which could well be very well guarded. Right. If this is difficult information to obtain, then the benchmarking exercise is going to be limited. And if you are a competitor, why would you share this important information? with their rival firm. And you know, a copying is copying really, so merely copying the ideas and practices of other firms may discourage innovation and original ideas. If you are looking to other firms for the inspiration for the driving force behind your production processes, perhaps you are missing out on innovation and original ideas that are specifically re related to what you are doing your core competencies, your unique selling point. And costs, right? The cost of benchmarking, the cost of the comparison exercise may not be recovered by the improvements obtained from benchmarking. Right, and now we look at national and international quality standards. We live in an amazing world, full of international standards organization and endless possibilities. But it can also be a complex and overwhelming place. When things don't work as they should, it often means that standards are absent. But when ISO standards are applied, life is just so much richer. ISO standards help to make the world a safer, cleaner and more efficient place. From food safety to computers. From healthcare to new technologies. There are many challenges facing our environment, economy and society. ISO can make a positive difference to all our lives. Utilizing a wealth of international experience and wisdom. In today's ever-changing world, ISO standards help create growth, open up global markets, and make trade fairer, including for developing countries. ISO standards can help tackle global challenges like climate change, road safety, energy, and social responsibility. 
ISO standards touch almost everything we do, keeping us connected and entertained, making us more productive, more creative, sharing ideas, promoting innovation, and keeping us safe and healthy. ISO is the world's largest developer of voluntary international standards. With over 18,000 standards for nearly every aspect of technology and business, for over 60 years, a network of standards bodies in 163 countries, working in partnership around the world and right here at home. ISO builds confidence for today, for tomorrow, and for the future. Right, the International Standards Organization um, certifies a range of quality standards and the most important one for our sake in the IB Business and Management course is ISO 9000. Now these awards show that certain quality standards have been met and that businesses are meeting or exceeding these standards and if they're doing so and they're certified as being doing so, they're permitted to include the quality award symbols or logos, logos on their products. And this it can then be used in their marketing. We meet certain quality standards. You can trust in us. We've been independently certified by this international standards organization. Now the IS. O9000 is an internationally recognized certificate that acknowledges the existence of a quality procedure that meets certain conditions. It's an award that's given to firms that can demonstrate that they have a quality assurance system in place which allows for quality to be regularly measured and for corrective action to be taken if quality falls below these levels. Now this award does not prove that every good produced or service provided by the business is of good quality. It is an indication that a business has a system of quality in place that has relevant targets set and activities ready to deal with a quality problem. To be able to get the ISO 9000 accreditation, the firm has to demonstrate that it has all of these following factors in place. Staff training and appraisal methods methods for checking on suppliers, quality standards in all areas of the business, procedures for dealing with defective products and quality failures, and an after-sales service. Now the benefits of a firm for being forced to establish quality assurance framework and to have this externally monitored are clear. There are however drawbacks such as the cost of preparing for inspection and bureaucratic form filling to gain the certificate. And importantly, an exam tip here, remember ISO 9000 is not a guarantee of good quality. It's an accreditation that the firm has good quality assurance processes in place. And don't forget to include that these quality standards are done they're tested by independent agents. They're not certified by the firm making the product. So to achieve a quality standard award, its product must undergo stringent and regular testing by independent agents. Okay, um, 5.4, done and dusted. Quality assurance. We'll be looking next time at... 5.4 and we're looking at location as part of operations management. I must have been, I was delighted, delighted as always to have you with me today. Um, IBBusinessAndManagement.com Go in there, have a look, summary notes, other videos um, outlining quality assurance processes. Having a good look at some of the the key key drivers behind the quality insurance program companies like Nissan and Toyota and the most amazing quality um, assurance processes they have in place I'm Mr. Bid we'll see you next time for 3.5